where there is a lot of uh, connectivities that uh, we are trying to connect, but some of uh, us, we are on load shedding. Uh, we hope this meeting will went well. The agenda of today, I hopefully it's a um, we gonna receive the briefing and researcher of our committees on firefell bill comment. And then from there we will discuss the second item that was amended yesterday where members uh, in, in, in the, I think they received it yesterday. It's um, a bill, electricity bill that was sent directly to us. I requested the officials to put this bill in front of us because I don't know the procedure, how did it, uh, the minister decided to send it to us direct, but we will discuss when it comes. And then the last one, it will be the adoption of our minutes. By so saying, uh, honor, uh, honorable members, you are welcome. Uh, let me get the move of the adoption of the agenda. BP adopts chairperson the agenda. Any second? Maybe. The agenda is uh, adopted. Yeah. Yes. Nyambi second. Oh, Honorable Nyambi. Papa. Our seconding, Mama. Thank you very much, Papa. Uh, without wasting any, any time, Kuobas and um, uh, Ms. Leroux, uh, researcher, can you take us through to all the comments from the stakeholders? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I am going to hand over the stakeholder engagement section to Guinea, the researcher, she performed the analysis of that, and then I will handle the second item that was added yesterday. So I'm not sure if Jeannie has got sharing rights, but I will request that she just quickly run through the comments that she analyzed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kubis. Uh, let me try and see if I can share my screen quickly. Okay, is the, I hope it's visible to everyone. Good morning, um, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you uh, quickly just through some of the, um, the, through the comments received on the uh, National Felt and Forest Fire Amendment Bill. Um, there were three um, submissions received from stakeholders. The one was from Kusatu the other from the Western Cape government and the other from the Lions River Fire Protection Association. Um, since the amendments proposed by the bill affect the fire protection associations in different ways, um, I thought it was quite interesting that only uh, one fire protection association submitted comments on the bill. Um, and they have been um, listed um, among the stakeholders in the bill, um, along with government departments and entities that were consulted. So. Um, but, a, but a complete list of the fire protection associations that were consulted um, was not included. So I thought um, an area that the committee could perhaps just keep an eye out for um, is whether all of the operational fire protection associations were notified of the opportunity to submit comments on the bill. Um, 
Key matters that were raised in the submissions from these stakeholders um, include law enforcement powers granted to traditional leaders, uh, the, the requirements and procedures involved in the establishment of fire protection associations, uh, the requirements for fire breaks, the standardization of fire risk categories, and the issuing of warnings and communication on fire dangers. Um, some of the content of these submissions appear to have been submitted on earlier versions of the bill as well. So um, some of the submissions where they refer to specific clauses relating to this version of the bill, while the, um, their comments are still valid um, in, in this version of the bill, the clauses do not necessarily match up. So um, it's just something to keep, to keep in mind going forward, perhaps. So um, I took the liberty um, to use a template that Quibus has previously used for the summaries. Um, so I hope this makes sense. In the left comment, um, I'm uh, in the in the left uh, column. Um, I've got the stakeholder's name, then the affected clause. Um, there would be more than one clause for for the comments that relate to uh, clauses that do not necessarily align um, with the current uh, number of the clause in in, in the bill, um, where these were previously also submitted um, and not incorporated or um, considered to that extent. Um, then the middle section would, of course, be the comment um, contained in the submissions. And then on the side on the right, I would just include some notes, um, either for clarification or just additional information or areas for the committee to note um, when it comes to further engagements with the department or stakeholders around this bill. So in terms of Kusati's submission, um, the one comment was that they were concerned um, about the provisions provided um, for peace and fire officers and traditional leaders um, with additional powers to enter, seize, uh, search, and arrest um, to enforce the provisions of the Bill and Act. Um, Kusat has stated that they support such powers being entrusted to law enforcement and fire officials, but are concerned about the handing of such powers to traditional authorities. They said that traditional authorities are not members of the South African Police Service um, or fire um, or law enforcement personnel. They asked on what legal basis um, uh, uh, they would have the power to enter, search, seize, and arrest. And they said that as ordinary citizens, they understand that they are empowered to effect a citizen's arrest upon a person suspected of committing a criminal offense, but that they believe that they do not have legal powers beyond that. Um, they stated that in cases of communal and traditional land, they are provided some custodial powers, but again, does not elevate them to members of the South African Police Services. Um, under the traditional courts authorities powers, Kusata felt that they are not empowered to arrest or deal with criminal offenses, and that they felt that government had to provide clarity on these matters. They stated that in order to ensure that the bill can pass constitutional muster, Parliament should delete references to traditional authorities having the powers to enter, search, seize, and arrest. Um, in the comment where I, uh, in the column where I provided notes, I will just uh, run through it quickly. Um, in its current form, the Act grants extensive powers to registered fire protection officers to enter, search, and seize property without a warrant under certain circumstances, as well as performing arrests. The Act requires in Section 6 that fire protection officers apply um, to the Director General for registration. The Bill proposes that these powers be extended to peace officers and traditional leaders who receive the adequate training from an accredited institution. The Principal Act does not appear to have been drafted with, with the aim of extending such powers to other stakeholders. Extending these powers to traditional leaders could potentially set a precedent for extending these powers to a wider range of stakeholders that also have not been involved in law enforcement in an official or professional capacity. The department can be requested to provide clarification on this matter. Um, in the same theme um, relating to the powers granted to traditional authorities, the Western Cape government submitted um, comments they stated that it is recommended that the references to traditional leaders be deleted from the relevant clause. To the extent that this recommendation is not accepted, it is recommended that this clause be amended to clarify that traditional leaders only have the authority to act in respect of communal land. They also stated that in terms of the proposed amendments to section 26 to A of the Principal Act, various persons, including traditional leaders, are given the power to enforce the Principal Act. 
In terms of the proposed amendments to, to the section, um, a reference to a fire protection officer in sections 27, 28, and 29 of the Principal Act includes a traditional leader. This will mean that traditional leaders will have the powers of entry, seize, uh, search, seizure, and arrest. Um, it is noted that entry, search, and seizure can be undertaken without a warrant. Um, it would not be appropriate to give traditional leaders the proposed powers for the reasons set out below, um, according to this submission. The only other role that traditional leaders play in the scheme of the bill is to facilitate the formation of a fire protection association. There is currently no express role for traditional leaders in the Principal Act. There is no rational connection between this role and law enforcement, according to this comment. Given the potential for the powers in sections 27, 28, and 29, um, relating to the entry, search, seizure, and arrest, to affect the rights of citizens and the legal implications of these powers, these powers should not be given to simply any person. It is noted that training will be provided. While training is important, powers of search and seizure should not be given to persons who have, appro who have appropriate knowledge, experience, and skills um, Oh, it should, sorry, should only be given to persons who have appropriate knowledge, experience and skills as well, <clears throat> for example, in areas such as law enforcement, fire and rescue services and environmental law, including knowledge of the provisions of the Principal Act. Um, then uh, with a notes column relating to this comment, in its current form, the Act grants extensive powers to uh, registered fire protection officers to enter, search and seize property without a warrant under certain circumstances, as well as performing arrest. The Principal Act does not appear to have been drafted with, with the aim of extending such powers to, the, to other stakeholders. Extending these powers to traditional leaders could potentially set a precedent for, for extending these uh, powers to a wider range of stakeholders that have also not been involved in law enforcement in an official or professional capacity. The proposal for only allowing traditional leaders to exercise these powers in the case of communal areas, should their involvement in law enforcement not be omitted in its entirety, could potentially lead to a greater fragmentation in regulation of various forms of land ownership. The department can be requested to provide clarification on this matter. Um, then moving on to the, to the next theme um, that, that, that um, arose in the submissions is the establishment of a fire protection association. Um, input was received from the Western Cape government on this matter. They commented that it is unclear what facilitating the formation of a fire protection association will entail and what resources will be required from municipalities and traditional councils. It is further unclear why municipalities and traditional leaders may facilitate the formation of, an, of a fire protection association if the ministers of the opinion that a fire protection association is required. It is noted that when the, the National Felt and Forest Fire, Protect, uh, fire Amendment Bill uh, uh, was in draft form published on 20 March 2015. The provision stated that they must facilitate the same. It is unclear why this was changed. The clause should be amended so as to provide clarity on what facilitating the formation of a fire protection association will entail and what resources will be required for municipalities and traditional council, councils. Consideration should further be given as to whether or not there should be an obligation versus a discretion. Um, in the notes uh, to this comment, um, the department can be requested to provide more details around these matters and whether these would be addressed in regulations perhaps. The department can furthermore provide clarity on the intent of the relevant clause and whether an obligation or a discretionary action is more appropriate. Moving on to the next theme, uh, requirements for joining a fire protection association. The submission on this, uh, this theme received from the Western Cape government stated, the proposed clause states that the, the owner in respect of state land, a state owned enterprise, a public entity or an organ of state must within a year after the commencement of the National Felt and Forest Fire Amendment Act, join a registered fire protection association in the area in which the land lies or is situated. Um, section three, um, subsection one of the National Felt and Forest Fire Act states that owners may, for, may form an association, emphasis added. Um, given that section three is discretionary, um, it is possible that some areas may not have a fire protection association. The proposed amendment to section four of the principal act should reflect this. Further, the phrase in the area in which the land is situated is vague and could lead to difficulties in interpretation. 
The language in legislation must be clear, especially where obligations are imposed on parties. Parties should know which five protection associations they are required to join. It is recommended that the wording be revised as follows. Join a fire protection association if such an association has been registered in the area in which the land is situated. Further, the clause should explain what the position will be should there not be an, uh, a fire protection association registered in an area within one year from the commencement of the Amendment Act. Would parties then need to join um, a fire protection, a protection association within a certain period after, the after it has been registered in the area? And further, the clause should be amended to clarify what is meant by in the area in which the land is situated. Further, the year 2021 should be replaced with 2023. This also applies to clause 9 um, or 10. Um, the notes on this comment, uh, there appears to be a potential discrepancy between the proposed phrasing in the bill and the wording contained in the Principal Act, um, mainly around the word, the use of the word must versus the word may. The date contained in the bill for, for commencement may also need to be revised. The department can be asked for clarity on this matter. Um, the next theme uh, revolves around fire breaks. Um, the submission on this matter received from the Western Cape government, um, uh, they are as follows. It is recommended that section 12 of the principal act be amended to allow for two landowners to agree on the act's preparation of a single fire break to rather than two fire breaks on both sides of the boundary line. The notes to this comment, um, this comment relates to the principal act and not a proposed amendment through a clause in the bill. This proposal can be considered by the department. The, the, the next uh, comment received relating to this theme Section 13A um, of the Principal Act read as follows. Requirements for fire breaks. An owner who is ob obliged to prepare and maintain a fire break must ensure that with due regard to the weather, climate, terrain and vegetation of the area, it is wide enough and long enough to have a reasonable chance of preventing a fault fire from spreading to or from neighboring land. A reasonable argument could be made that the current wedding of this provision results in inappropriate fire breaks being established. In extreme weather events, for example, a gale force wind, a 200 meter wide fire break may not be considered as reasonable. It is argued that the purpose of a fire break is to facilitate the implementation of control measures such as backburns, rather than to try to prevent fires. It may even be appropriate that a fire break is not located on the boundary, but along a along a road that may not be situated on the boundary. It is recommended that the wording be amended to allow for an agreement between landowners on the width and nature of a fire break, and that the wording refer to fire breaks from which reasonable control measures could be implemented to prevent the spreading of felt fires. In the circumstances, it is recommended that section 13 of the Principal Act be amended as follows. Um, requirements for fire breaks. An owner who is obliged to prepare, um, prepares and maintains a fire break um, must do so in a manner as agreed to with the owner of neighboring land and such fire break must um, ensure that with due regard for the weather, climate, terrain and vegetation of the area, it be wide enough and long enough to facilitate the implementation of reasonable measures to control um, and have a reasonable chance of preventing a felt fire from spreading to or from neighboring land. Um, comments, uh, notes on this comment. Uh, this comment relates to the Principal Act and not a proposed amendment through the, a clause in the bill. This proposal can, however, be considered by the department. Moving on to the next theme, uh, they relate to definition style, spelling and grammar matters. Um, I'm going to run through these quickly. Um, from the Western Cape government, um, the affected clause relates to the definition for municipality. Um, they asked that the, or they requested that the word system should be replaced with systems. This is in relation to the um, Municipal Systems Act, where the, the plural um, is at the end for system was just omitted. The department can be requested to make any necessary amendments in this regard. Um, the following comment was received also from the Western Cape government. Um, relating to clause five or six. Uh, the first letter of the word department should be a small letter, given that the term department with a capital letter 
refers to the national department which has responsibility for the management of felt fires and not the department responsible for the administration of the South African Weather Services Act um, or any other agreement that may be reached. Um, for example, using an access road as an appropriate fire break. Um, the note to this comment is that the department uh, can review the relevant clause to verify whether the current spelling has material impacts on the interpretation of the bill. Um, the other comment received from the Western Cape government relates to the long title of the bill. They requested that the word matter should be changed uh, to matters. Um, uh, it relates to the last line of the long title. The department should be or could be asked to revisit the long title and make the necessary correction. Um, the next theme relates to the standardization of fire risk categories and communication on fire dangers. Um, these uh, inputs were received from the, the Lions River Fire Protection Association, um, and the, the affected clause is clause four. Um, in relation to amendment of section 10 of the Principal Act, this clause is ex extremely important from a legal perspective in respect of fire protection associations being in a position to implement fire danger warnings for and on behalf of the minister um, relative to what is communicated by the minister to what is communicated by the South African Weather Services by all or any media channels. The public or the landowner cannot be confused or misled in any way as to a warning issued or published by the minister which refers to words high or extreme and a warning issued or published by the department, um, departmental agency, um, which reads very dangerous or extremely dangerous. Um, the South African Weather Service is um, an agency of the department which is permitted to issue warnings and the South African Weather Service is also a co-party or agency responsible for the administration of the Act. Hence, the Minister must or will be guided by the South African Weather Service. Um, and this is per the, the agency terminology. Um, it is further noted in terms of the Act, uh, Section 9, Subsection 4, that the fire uh, danger rating system must, um, and then again, uh, section 94C of the Act states, show the rating in a clear format. The current fire danger rating system utilized by the South African Weather Service, as per the pro uh, proposed amendment section 11A, uh, the South African Weather Bureau Service established in terms of the South African Weather Service Act, um, if the Director General of the Department responsible for the administration of the said act agrees and others is based on the low, low felt fire danger index rating methodology per notice uh, 1099 um, from 15 November 2013, which spans from a blue to a red. In terms of clause four, as proposed reference is made to high or extreme, however, there is no cor correlation or alignment of the terminology of high or extreme to the current legislated fire danger rating index, nor to the South African Weather Service fire danger index values and terminology. In terms of subsection 1b, the legislation refers to the South African Weather Service per the amendment, and hence the wording or terminology in terms of the said clause must align with that of the South African Weather Service and correlate with section 91 of the Act um, as the South, South African Weather Service, as the department's agency, the entity which uh, issues uh, weather-related warnings. The proposed amendment of this clause should read, when the minister has published a warning in terms of subsection 1b, no person may light, use or maintain a fire in the open air in the region where the fire danger rating is very dangerous or extremely dangerous, unless the minister um, on a good cause shown, exempts in writing a landowner or group of landowners from the said warning, subject to any conditions that the minister may impose. In terms of the above, the following clauses of the Act will also need to be amended. Um, uh, 9.4, uh, uh, identify what activities are dangerous and what precautions should be taken for each rating and when the fire danger is rated as very dangerous or extremely dangerous. Um, section 12, um, an owner may not burn a fire break despite having complied with subsection 2 if the Fire Protection Association objects to the proposed burning or a warning has been published in terms of subsection 10.1b because the fire danger is very dangerous or extremely dangerous in the region. Uh, the notes to this comment, um, the department could be requested to verify and ensure appropriate alignment of the bill with existing legislation, standards and terminology around this matter. This should include alignment of the proposed terminolo terminology used in the bill 
and applicable legislated fire danger ratings and indexes, such as the South African Weather Service fire danger index values and terminology. It is important that there is coherence and alignment um, between different role players to ensure standardized communication and information being shared with the public to prevent any uncertainty. Um, the next comment received from the Fire Protection Association is that in terms of uh, section uh, 10.1b um, and uh, yeah, section uh, 10.1b of the Principal Act, the required publishing of warnings via local newspapers is very cumbersome and often cannot be achieved as warnings can be issued overnight and hence too late for publication. Um, the said clause should be amended according and aligned to generally accepted media channels of the current day and age. In addition, section uh, 10.1 states must, which is legally on uh, onerous, if the warning is not published in a local newspaper, a landowner can do as they please, in other words. Clause 10.1 can be read in conjunction with 10.4 and the minister has an opportunity in case of the latter to publish in a newspaper or any other means. Um, it states that the minister must communicate the rating of the fire danger for each region to the fire protection associations in that region regularly when the fire danger is rated as very dangerous and or extremely dangerous in any region publish a warning at the earliest possible opportunity in all the main languages used in that region on three television channels and three radio stations broadcasting to that region and on the South African Weather Service website and ensure that recordings are kept of the broadcast and copies are kept of website notices. The warning referred to in subsection 1b must uh, state that the fire danger is very dangerous or extremely dangerous Refer to the prohibition on light, uh, lighting, using or maintaining fires in the open air. Uh, identify the region in which and the period for which the prohibition applies. The minister may publish the warning in such other media or employ any other means as he or she considers appropriate to ensure that it is effectively communicated. The note um, accompanying this submission's comment uh, the, the department could be requested to consider the practicality and efficacy of current and proposed communication channels in relation to issuing warnings. If and when necessary, the department can respond with the potential amendments to ensure effective, efficient, practical, fair and cost effective communication around these matters. Um, this brings us to the end of the submissions received. Um, I hope this um, was at least a little bit informative. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Kubis now from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. Leroux. Kubis. Thanks, Chair. I just quickly wanted to highlight to the members that this is a Section 75 bill. So it is not being processed through provinces. The submissions were called for by the committee and have been forwarded to the department, but there will not be any need for provincial engagement and provincial consultation. The process will now basically continue between the committee and the department. In terms of my section of the presentation i just quickly want to start sharing the bowls or, or the, the presentation that i've put together the background but i just need to get to the section the background to this section of the meeting today was the fact that, as Chair highlighted, a letter was sent to the chairperson of the select committee directly from the DMRE ministry, indicating that a bill has been submitted to Parliament for consideration. It was a little bit confusing in that such a letter has not been sent to the committee in the past. Normally a bill would be referred to the committee via 
the house chairs after a bill was tagged as a section 76 or a section 75 but normally it would be started in terms of consultation in the national assembly passed by the national assembly and then, then referred to the ncop and the ncop would then assign it to the correct committee therefore the communication from the minister of the dmre was a little bit confusing in the process of finding out what exactly the reason for this was i was asked to just add a small discussion on this bill and the way forward to today's agenda after it was added to the agenda we finally got clarity back from the ncop stating that the bill has only just been introduced into parliament and that it has not been tagged yet the the reason that the committee was communicated with directly by the ministry was merely for informative purposes to introduce the bill and the fact that the bill has been submitted to parliament by the department at the present time what i uh, after communicating this to the chairperson what i decided to do is to just quickly put a background document together for the committee to consider in terms of bills before the committee because what has been referred to parliament yesterday is a very important bill i will highlight the bill as we go through the short presentation but considering that this bill still has to go through the joint tagging committee then to the national assembly then to the ncop the timelines that the committee is faced with dealing with this and quite a few other very important bills is now becoming a critical concern and there are a couple of steps that the committee might have to consider from this point forward to deal with legislation and moving towards the end of the sixth parliamentary term. So what I have put together is just quickly the background for this presentation. When the committee was briefed by the departments this year again about their APPs and their budgets, one of the key topics that was questioned in a couple of instances was the amount of bills that the department still stated that they wish to introduce to parliament in its current term and the fact that those bills have either not been introduced into parliament or has not made it very far through the parliamentary processes so Post the strategic planning update on the number of bills before Parliament and those yet to be referred, another scan of information sources on bills that are before Parliament was done, and a few more bills could potentially have been identified that was not on the radar during strategic planning. Then, as stated before, there's a need to perhaps develop a way forward in liaising inside parliament with the national assembly and the presiding officers of the ncop regarding how bills will be prioritized towards the end of term and then also considering the amount of section 76 is before the committee how the committee will liaise with provinces in order to ensure that there is a coordinated and effective method of referring bills to provinces for consultation. What has happened in the past is where Parliament had reached a point where more than one bill was being processed at the same time, and two or more bills from the same committee ended up being referred to a province within the six week cycle of each bill, provinces had to communicate back to parliament to just highlight the fact that their 
capacity to engage the public on bowls are being overstretched. And therefore, no strategy in processing bowls can really be developed in the NCOP without careful consideration of the programs and the capacities to engage at provincial legislature, uh, sorry, the provincial legislatures. What I have done on this screen quickly is just to highlight what remains of the rest of 2023 and to make an educated guess of what activity there would still be possible in 2024. As stated, there's a bit of concern about meeting opportunities remaining and the amount of bulls potentially still waiting for the committee. Term one is completed. Term two at present on the program is almost fully allocated with five meetings still to take place. My apologies for this area. It's not 276 that's being processed, 176, 175. Two bulls are before the committee but we have not yet reached the mandating phase on the section 76. And it's therefore uncertain whether both bills will be completed within the five meeting window that's still left for term two. Likely there'll be some carry over into term three. Term three is only from the 5th to the 22nd of September based on the program that I received yesterday, which gives you four weeks of engagement time, but the NCOP also lists as activities a provincial week, questions to the deputy president in September, and also an NCOP oversight week towards the end of September as options. Therefore, it might be unlikely that all three weeks, or all four weeks, sorry, of term three would be available for meetings, you've got three, perhaps four meetings that can occur in term three. In term four is an eight week term, but also contains the NCOP local government week and take parliament to people report back in those eight weeks. Therefore, again, there's likely four uh, I mean, sorry, six meetings with a maximum of eight available in term four. There's no indication of how much time will be available in 2024, but for argument's sake, it will unlikely be more than eight weeks, which is what the typical first term without an election year in it would consist of. The committee would therefore have to develop the most effective manner in planning for the remaining 25 meetings and to ensure that these are fully utilized. The 25 is an estimate of what is left for the entire yes. part. Yellow, Chair. Chair? Or I'm the only one who are not uh, hearing him. Sorry, Chair. I'm... He's audible. I can okay. hear him. I oh. can hear him, Chairperson. Oh, okay. From my side, I, would, I didn't hear him, but now I can hear him. Okay. I, sorry, you can my continue, apologies. Sorry. Okay. Just need to get back to the presentation. Okay. That's. From my estimates, there is a maximum of 25 meeting opportunities left in this term. And therefore the committee needs to have an urgent review of the focus areas that are programmed and whether the committee will reach a point where all other matters are set aside for legislation or whether there's still a need to program other activities such as important briefings and oversights into the program of the committee. 
the reason for the concern basically revolves around what I can find as listed as bills before NA committees. If you look at the Parliamentary Monitoring Group's website, they track any bill that has been introduced during this term. It, it might not be anywhere near being referred to the committee, but they have a full list of bills that have been submitted to the National Assembly. And going through that list, there is 13 potential bills in the National Assembly at present that could, in theory, be referred to this committee, of which the majority are Section 76s. What I have done is not to try and elevate some bills above others, but to consider which bills that are 76s and might require a significant amount of public engagement in order to ensure that there's not unhappiness about the due diligence of consultation during a Section 76 process. There are six bills currently before Parliament, as well as the newly introduced bill, which I cannot imagine that a six-week cycle would be long enough to complete. I highlighted those, but just sort of quick comments, the illegal eviction of unlawful occupation of land is always a contentious issue. There would be significant input from both sides of the individuals accused of being unlawfully on a piece of land, the people who consider themselves lawful owners of the land. That situation is never straightforward to consult on, on a bill. The climate change bill is not an insignificant bill at all. It would also have major contentious inputs from the energy sector on one end and the environmental sector on the other end, and also potentially those businesses and industries affected by any mitigation or adaptation processes proposed in this bill. Preservation and development of agricultural land bill. Also, there's significant competition for land and land use in the country. It's ongoing and would require a fair amount of consultation. The upstream petroleum resources development bill has shown itself to be contentious during engagements with the National Assembly and would most likely remain contentious mostly from a perspective of for the industry versus against the industry inputs being received. People are significantly polarized on that bill. The two underlying bills are currently before the committee. Then the last two, independent electricity management operator bill and communal property associations amendment bill both as well, for both of those bills, it is a broad spectrum of individuals or contentious topic that will have to be consulted on. The bill that was introduced or the letter communicating the introduction of the bill that was received yesterday is for the Electricity Regulation Act Amendment Bill. Now, this bill is vital for many of the SONA commitments of the past couple of years made to be implemented. It revolves around the national energy transmission system, independent energy supply and purchasing, everything that is currently being discussed in terms of restructuring ESCOM of potentially broadening the amount of individuals or companies that can become energy suppliers is affected by this bill. And it's probably likely safe to say that there will be significant push for and potentially against this bill being passed by the end of the year, depending on which side of the energy spectrum the inputs are received from. What the committee is faced with is that 
each section 76 bill has to be referred to provinces and if the committee is concerned about the bill might call for inputs independently of the provincial process typically within parliament's operating legal legal processing framework a 76 bill cannot be processed in less than six weeks even within six weeks there has been significant unhappiness about fast processing of some bills and this has resulted in legal challenges in the past highlighting lack of consultation those went against parliament and therefore there will not really be any benefit in attempting to push 76 bills towards the end of the year where that six week cycle is considered significant or uh, sufficient for consultation. Another area where there has been significant unhappiness in the past is when bills are open for public comment in the December, January holiday period. The committee will have to be cautious in providing sufficient comment time in that period should bills be received and if there is a need to start processing them in the fourth term more than ample public input opportunities have to be given but if one goes back to the 25 weeks that the committee has potentially on its program left if processing bills concurrently which means not sending more than one bill to a province at a time for consultation there will only be space for four bills which is impossible to consider because there's 13 plus one that could potentially come to the committee i re just referred back to that list there's at least seven bills that could and should require more than six weeks worth of processing Thus, if, if we look at the figures stated and we make assumptions about the number of bills that are going to be referred to the committee, there's going to be a need for more time than what the committee has available, which would most likely result in, number one, the rest of the program of the committee being cleared, and number two, the committee needing to prioritise on the bills being processed. So I've just got this pop up on my side of the screen. There we go. The immediate needs from a planning perspective, therefore, is that the committee needs a clear indication of the estimated completion time of the bills within National Assembly committees. What is proposed in this regard is that the Secretariat has developed a communication, uh, basically a letter requesting comment back from the Secretariats of the other committees in the National Assembly to give an indication of which bills are close to being finalized and referred to the committee. That would alleviate some of the planning concerns that rather than thinking that there are 13 bills on the way, there might only be five on the way. Realistically, some of these bills might have been abandoned or delayed within the National Assembly, making it not unnecessary to be concerned about them reaching the NCOP in the near future. What also needs to happen from a secretariat perspective is that the committee needs to liaise with provinces and to determine the pro proven each province's capacity for processing bills, how what their programs look like, what the likely cutoff dates are at which point they will be rising or where they will not be able to introduce further bills for public participation for the committee, therefore, to understand what the window for public participation is in each province. Thirdly, 
there's a need for the committee's leadership to consider liaising with the NCOP's presiding officers to determine whether there's a need to further engage National Assembly counterparts regarding the completion of pending legislation, or alternatively to provide a cutoff date on the calendar where the committee would not be able to commence processing of any more bills. This was done at the end of the previous parliamentary term. There was concern about the National Assembly taking too long to finalize bills and then rushing bills to the National Assembly, which in turn resulted in poor consultation on those bills and legal action being directed specifically at the NCOP and not at the National Assembly where these bills sat for years before they were being rushed at the end of a term. There could be a need to open up channels of communication just to say the amount of bills sitting in the National Assembly cannot from this point forward be processed by the NCOP in a fair and a sorry this <clears throat> chest is not all that happy cannot be processed in what is legally considered to be efficient and sufficient public engagement and that's that's the risk of being put into a rushed situation there is very little purpose in rushing a bill in a manner that's going to result in a legal challenge. The only way to process the bills is in a fair and effective and proper amount of time being given for public participation. Therefore, the time that the committee has remaining is of critical importance. Chair, that is the end of the show. From, from my side. So the main concern on those last slides is the Secretariat has initiated the development of communication to go to other committee secretaries, but also proposes that provinces are engaged in order for us to understand their capacity. And if the committee feels it is of sufficient enough concern, if the feedback from the NA is such that we are positive that too many bills are going to reach the committee before the end of term, then some discussion would have to be held with the presiding officers to state that there's a risk in attempting to finalize certain bills because of public participation shortcomings, or that there should simply be a window that if a bill isn't in the committee by that time, because of the risks involved, the committee will have to state through the NCOP that it simply cannot start a bill that cannot be completed. That, those are just basically my inputs on the introduction of the bill yesterday, adding to the bills that we have before us now, Chair. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Kuobas. Um... Now, before I can give to honorable members for their comments, let me give the legal advisors because I suppose they are in our meeting so that they can guide us. They can give us a legal opinion in all the bills that um, those bills, the two bills that we have been presenting. I'm not going to call them by name, but uh, I saw them, they are in the meeting. legal teams from parliament or from state uh, state uh, state law advice anyone is in the meeting or not Amanda and Bulelwa, can you assist us? Do we have any state law advisors in our committee in our meeting today? Morning, no, not that I'm aware of, but I'm looking through the names. I'm not seeing anyone. Oh, okay. 
They were not invited. Mm, I just want to check with you. Did we invite them? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I just want to, to ask uh, or to make a comment and say, first of all, thank you very much for all this information and the analysis of, of what's going on, on the bills and the available time left. I think uh, if we would like to have a legal opinion, we should get the, the, the legal opinion of the, the, the House, the NCOP, because it's, it, it's, um, it's regarding the processes uh, within in, in, in Parliament. The state uh, legal advisor, um, I am not so sure that they would be able to guide us because they normally we 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 or committees and departments liaise with them on uh, the constitutionality of the bill and and that kind of thing. I'm not so sure if they are that di directly involved with the process when the bill has already been introduced into the parliament process. But I um, I might be wrong. Um, what I want to say, Chair, is. Um, uh, the fact that the 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 number of bills, uh, the time it need it some of these bills takes because the nature of the bills as so rightly um, being focused on by Mr. Euster, as well as uh, the process that it takes when it goes to provinces is a subject that I myself has introduced to the NCOP. It's a whips meeting since the end of last year. It's an ongoing discussion, but there's no finalization yet. I've requested a cutoff date, all these things um, uh, that, that could be done in the NCOP that has been done in the fifth parliament. I advocated for that in the whips meeting as well as in the programming meeting. So I would really appreciate and recommend that the recommendation that Mr. U has to put up that this should be taken up with the presiding officers. And actually I would really urge the chairs of the committees to also take that up because uh, the whips uh, are, are, you know, have taken it up and it's been discussed. But I also think the chairs of the committees would have some weight in, in, in also bringing this to the attention of the presiding officer and, and let us have a decision on that. And then Chair, I would like to also, I know it's a little bit late in the, in the, in the uh, term, but you know, uh, we really as, as the NCOP should go and look, have a look at, uh, you know, the whole thing about the Mandating Act and provinces doing, um, you know, 76 bills when it goes out for public participation. We are doing our part of public participation because the constitution says we can, but what do we do with that, with that then? Then it goes out to the provinces while they're already busy with their public participation. That also creates um, some uh, confusion and that's never been solved in one or other way. Uh, then I just want to make sure uh, the bill, this Electricity Regulation Act Amendment Bill that uh, Mr. Yuster just referred to, is that the bill that you said has not been tabled yet and has not been um, uh, 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 tagged yet? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh... Honorable Labuskakne. Honorable Labuskakne, normally when we are dealing with the, the bills, we invited all the legal um, fractional. We invited the state law advisors, we invited SOP legal advisors, 
and then the department will come with the their legal teams. So that is the reason why I was asking uh, whether they are in the meeting, but unfortunately they are not in the meeting. Uh, members, I will give to you to your comments. Let's start with the comment from the first presentation from the researcher uh, on the firefell bill. And then we'll go to the last uh, presentation from content advisor. Any, any comment? Any comment from members, Honorable Mamangwenya? Honorable Mamangwenya? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning to all the members. Uh, Honorable Chair, I would like also to, to thank the presentation that you have put in front of us. I've got a few questions, Chair, that I'm going to ask for now. On the submission that the committee has received from the three stakeholders about the National Field and Forest Bill. Chair, I wanted to check that it did the committee advise, advertise calling and inviting the stakeholders to make submissions. If yes, which media platform did we use to advertise? And did we reach all the provinces? Uh, two, Chair, I want to check what is the current state of the progress in Section 76 bill? which are currently before provinces. And are we monitoring the provinces and have all provinces been briefed? And how many are yet to be briefed? The third question chair is on the section 76 bill, which are currently before our committee. I want to check, are there any timelines that attach in terms of the period of which the bills are expected to be finalized since they were introduced by the department. I thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Kale Bohame. Kale Bohame, Honorable Kethi, is it a legacy hand or the new hand? It's a new hand, Chair. Okay, you can continue, Mama. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to know, uh, on the submissions that we received, the three submissions and the, uh, the uh, feedback from the department, what is going to happen with these submissions now? Will, will that be, be sent to the provinces also, or how are we going as a, as a committee? How are we going to deal with that? Are you done, Mama? Okay, thank you very much. Kuba Samanda and Bulelwa. There are three, four questions. In fact, from Mom said, did the, the this bill be uh, advertised? If yes, where did we advertise? Which media did you put, you advertise this a bill to? And then the question for, did the provinces uh, being be briefed is for all of us honorable members, because the department uh, presented this bill to us and for us is to go to our own provinces to brief them. If not yet, Maybe the provinces are delaying to give us the date. We can come up uh, with the answer. Give us the answer. And then uh, the last one from Mama uh, Laboskahi. OK, 
can you answer those questions? Kubas, uh, me researcher, me bulelo, me Amanda. Yeah, yes, thanks. I will start with what I know about the process. If anybody from the Secretariat knows a bit more about the advertising processes, they might be able to assist me on that side because that is a part of the work that's normally handled entirely by Askar. I am not involved in the advertisements made to for public input in general. What has happened with the request for inputs yes the committee did call for those requests for inputs and the standard parliamentary procedures for advertising would entail a mix of media and online that reaches all provinces the exact details of what was used in this case if it is needed i can request ask or Bulawa, if Asgard is not available in the next couple of days, to clarify which process exactly was followed. But there are standard methods of communication, and the committee did engage the public in and requested for inputs on that one, on the National Felt and Forest Fire Bill. On the second question, Chair, I'm not going to say much more than what you have stated already. The, the committee was briefed on it. The provincial delegates that could make it to the briefing was also in the briefing. And from that point, it becomes a provincial scheduling process that I am also not involved with. The third question. There are only there's only one section 76 before the committee at present. What is referred to in the law or, or the rules of parliament around processing section 76 bills is a little bit contentious. It gives six weeks for a committee to finalize bills apart from where a committee asks for exemption. Because of the challenges that a six week beginning to end cycle creates, the committee as a standard asks for an extension on the section uh, on the six weeks rule. And that is typically granted. And I'm assuming that ASCA had applied for an extension on the six weeks cycle. I will again, just have to clarify between Bulawa and ASCA, but I'm positive that it has almost become standard practice in the committee to ask for that extension. The extension basically just waives the rule and within due process allows the committee to finalize the bill without any restrictions to be within a six week cycle, but without an end time stipulated. If it takes too long, there are times when inquiries are being raised about timelines, but once extension has been granted, there's not a new deadline provided typically. In terms of the current 75 process, these submissions that were made to the committee will be communicated to the department. It's a consultation process that now involves the inputs received by the committee, as well as issues raised by the committee put before the department for consideration. It is not going to be inclusive of any provincial participation. It is a process between the department and the committee from this point forward. They, I presume, I haven't seen it in the program, I will just have to double check when it will take place, but there would be interactions between the committee and the department to consider the inputs that the, the, the committee has as concerns about the bill. As Jeannie also pointed out, many of these likely were raised in the PC consultation process. Therefore, the department would be familiar with them and would, I believe, rapidly be able to explain to the committee why these were perhaps considered and not included or a amended version of what was proposed was included, but that consultation between the department and the committee will take place until the committee is satisfied that 
the department has answered the inputs received from the public and also any questions that would be raised inside the committee. Uh, if, if any of my colleagues want to add or highlight anything that I've missed, I will give them the floor now. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Kuomas. Uh, is it Landu in the meeting? So that he can clarify on the issue of uh, which media house did he, she advertise the bail to? She's not in the meeting, eh? Okay. Um, no, she isn't. She's in, in, not in the meeting. Okay. Members, um, I think, let me say the not necessary for answering for members. For, I think um, the time when the department presented the bill, we invited all the provinces, though normally we invite the provinces and then after that we go to our province to brief them. But if not, uh, if we are not yet a brief the provinces, it's very key, important for us to go back to our provinces and brief them. And maybe check with, we must check with our provinces how far uh, are they with the process of the bill. Because sometimes, even if we didn't uh, brief them, but they can they continue with their own um, process there. So let's check them so that when come the time when we need the mandate and when we discuss the mandate from the provinces, uh, it must be all the provinces be briefed and all the provinces have to participate in this bill. So. I think uh, it will be fair enough, but if there's one person who wanted to say something about the briefing of the provinces, he or she is allowed. Oh, Eme, Akitura, Kimme, or Ki Benjamin. Thank you, Chair. It's uh, Verna Benjamin. I'm a legal advisor in the KZN legislature. Oh, yes. I, just, I just want to get some clarification, please, on the, um, the Felt Fires Amendment Bill. Uh, the province was under the impression that it's a Section 76 bill based on some program, um, the MCOP programming report. So we had arranged a briefing uh, tomorrow uh, by the department to brief us because we were under the impression that mandates would be required in respect of the uh, felt fires amendment bill. Can we just get clarification? Because I wasn't sure if I heard uh, Kuba say that it's a section 75 bill that will not require mandates. I just want clarification on that because I know we are starting to run with our processes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mayor. Anyone? Any comment, any question from, yeah, thank you very much uh, because at least now we are having some illegal uh, representative from the other provinces. I can see even Mele Jaka from Northwest, a legal advisor, she's there and other legal advisors from other provinces are there in the meeting. So Kubas, uh, I don't know, did you refer this bill, uh, section, uh, Firefield bill as a section 75, or you were talking about electricity bill? You know, the electricity bill has not been tagged yet. I am apologizing profusely if I created any kind of confusion between the provincial legislatures now and myself, I had checked the tagging of the bill on online resources. 
I didn't want to bother Asghar. He's on his way to treatment. And I uh, try to quickly determine if it's a 75 or a 76, but the details that I had received was that it was tagged as a 75. It could be that it was one of these bowls that was first tagged as a 75 and then changed to a 76. So again, I, I apologize if I have it wrong, which is entirely possible. This is normally something that is clear on our documents, but I have had a quick look and from what I saw this morning, it was tagged as a 75 with the information that I've got. It's an important thing to get right. So I don't want to create a situation where the information is wrong. I am busy right now trying to check it out. And if the meeting is over before that information is clarified, then I will communicate with everybody involved. But unfortunately, the information that I had used when I put the presentation together had a tag as a 75. I will instantly clarify if I'm incorrect, Chair. My apologies. Chair. Uh, yes, Honorable Lovis Gaffney. Chair, I can, I can just come in here. Um, this bill has been tagged originally as a 75 bill, but according to the information uh, that we got in the programming meeting, I specifically raised this question, or there was questions raised, it was re-tagged as a 76 bill. This is the Felton Forest Amendment bill that we're talking about. The ball that we're busy with, or oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Mem uh, According to my knowledge, also, uh, Firefell Bill is section seventy six. My apologies, Chair, then that was my mistake. I was running on the information that I had on the ball. I didn't cross check it with anything that was changed after the meetings that was referred to now. So my apologies and also my apologies to the KZN legislature if I caused a little bit of confusion. So yes, Chair, then, then we've got two 76s before us now, the original 76 and this one as well, that was retagged as a 76, my apologies. Okay, um, uh, ma'am from uh, ma'am from KZN, you can continue with your briefing tomorrow. This bill is section seventy six. Uh, we will need the mandate from the provinces, so you can continue. Each and every one who is in the meeting from other provinces, if you are already a uh, process. Assessing the bill, continue. The bill is seven, section 76. You can give the information to the province that this bill will need the mandate. And the mandate will need it as soon as we, when, uh, when we come back or somewhere in June, somewhere in June, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I, I cannot uh, put the date. Honorable member uh, and official uh, colleagues, I think uh, there is no any comment or any comment from the aside. <clears throat> the reason why I ask uh, Mary Secha and two of us to put this, uh, do the presentation to in front of the committee. It was uh, to get information for us to be able to know that we don't have time, number one, but there are a lot of bills. So what I will do with the secretariat, we will try to choose uh, 76 bills that will come as, for example, the, the very important, not necessary. Other bills are not important, but the most important, for example, your gas bill, if it can come uh, on time, your climate change bill, 
and we will see, but we are not going to do more than four bills. It's, we, we will deal with only four bills that will, that will come to us on time. The rest of the bill, we are not going to do them because we don't have time. We don't have a meeting. Um, we don't have the, uh, uh, yeah, we don't have time. So, and from you, all members from this committee, like Mama Laboskakni and other members, in your WIPARI, please, you must request that at some point we will take one week in our constituency, uh, uh, constituency leave to go to do the oversight or to go to do the public hearing because really we don't have time. And yeah, we don't have time. So I will request you the whips uh, to make sure that they talk to the uh, whip, uh, chief whip and also, hello. <laughs> Can you mute? And also on our side, I'm, I'm with Honorable Nyambi in this meeting. From our side, we'll, I will try to convince him in, in, in our meeting, I mean, to, to say they must allow us uh, during the constituency period to do oversight or to do public hearing so that at least we do something that uh, will benefit our provinces. By so saying, honorable members and officials, let me release the representative from the provinces and thank you very much for attending our meeting and your participation in our meeting. Thank you very much. It, we really appreciate that. So you are released members from the provinces. And then members, you can remain so that we can continue the business of our committee. While they are leaving our meeting, Bulelwa, you can. Put the minutes of our last meeting. Bulelwa or Amanda. Yes, so I am trying to display my, to share my screen quickly. <clears throat> okay, while you are still busy doing that, honorable member, I will request you to say, uh, you can realize that since, is it January when we come back or this year, uh, Mr. Bawa is not, uh, in our meeting and he can even not uh, be able to speak. Sometimes he can log in, but he cannot speak, be able to speak. Uh, he's, in, he's facing a difficult, difficult time. So I will request you members at some point, you need to send him a message just to give him a hope. Uh, because he's doing he's doing in dialysis in 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 his uh, throat throat dialysis and he cannot speak he doesn't have voice yeah but he can write so I'll request you members to do Ubuntu just to say hey hi hope you are doing well yeah and you will be fine. You know how to do it. Uh, honorable members, um, I put the minutes of 
last week in front of you. for consideration though in, in in front of me Bulelwa, i don't see the minutes i just see the dates the 2 the 9 the 14 the 25 i don't see any the minutes in front of me because okay. i i did I did receive the minutes um, on time. Yes, Honorable Member Mama. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chair. I was saying, Chair, even if we not have your minutes in front of you or in the screen, we have get a minutes on time. Um, I think, Chair, we can adopt the minutes unless other members, they, they've got something to say before I adopt the minutes, but we did get the minutes, Chair, on time. Here is it. Honorable Chair? Yes, ma'am. I was saying, Chair, we do have minutes in front of us, so we did get it on time. I would like okay. it to, uh, to propose that uh, we must adopt the minutes, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Mom, baby. Uh, Mom, uh, Honorable Nguyenya, move for adoption. Any second? Mom, baby. Second, Chairperson. Thank you. Honorable, Honorable Mom, second. Thank you very much, Ma. Uh, the minutes of the Oh yes, I can see them. Last our last meeting have been adopted. Anything else? Yes, Chairperson. Yes, Honorable uh, Eva. Kiva. Uh, Chairperson, I would like to move for the closure of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, this meeting is officially closed. Oh, I can I can see you are all, you are on rush. The no, meeting no, no, is no. officially closed. I'm, I'm not rushing.